And as we got below the weather, I can just remember this, seeing this firefight. I'd never been so low seeing a firefight, so it was very real. I mean, I could see the tracers and smoke and, you know, I could see bright flashes and just this huge firefight happening back and forth across the river. And then suddenly, as I'm kind of watching this firefight happening and we're talking about how we're going to set up to do a quick guns pass, I suddenly see these puffs of gray and white smoke. And now they're now they're in the air right next to my cockpit and, you know, just bright flashes. And so, you know, it's this sudden reality of not only is there a firefight happening across the river, but now the enemy is shooting up at us, too. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Kim Casey Campbell, a retired Air Force Colonel and A-10 fighter pilot. She racked up over 1,800 flight hours in the Warthog, 375 of those in combat across more than 100 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. She's also got one of the coolest call signs ever, killer chick. For anyone who's been on the ground and seen an A-10 on a gun run, you can understand why so many ground pounders love this platform. For Apache pilots like myself, the A-10 is our fixed wing cousin, and we feel a very close affinity with this incredible machine. Outside the cockpit, Kim is steeped in leadership development. She led the Air Force Academy's Center for Character and Leadership Development, and since retiring, has carried that expertise into the private sector, where she provides leadership assessment and development in addition to keynote and motivational speeches for companies and organizations. She's delivered rounds on target in heated battles and narrowly avoided death on multiple occasions, including being hit with a surface-to-air missile. I hope you enjoyed this insightful combat story from the cockpit of the killer chick as much as I did. Jim, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. So for nine out of 10 of my guest interviews, I start out with kind of the origin story where they were as a kid, but the exception I make are for pilots where I like <laughs> to get straight into the, uh, the nitty gritty of call signs. So okay. yours is Kim Casey Campbell. I think I know what the KC is, but I just wanted to you to explain the origin of that. And if there's anything crazy that came about because of it. So Fighter pilot call signs are always kind of interesting because uh, we're not actually in the room when we get our call sign. We uh, we're generally sent outside the room. It tends to be on a Friday night with a lot of uh, heavy drinking in the bar, so the stories get uh, elaborate, and uh, you kind of just hear what happens when you come back in from the room. So uh, on this Friday night, as I walk back into the room, uh, you know, to cheers from all the other pilots in my uh, in my squadron. They said, your call sign is now Killer Chick. So Casey is, yes, it is my initials, but it is also Killer Chick. And uh, I think the obvious part of this is that I was the only female in my fighter squadron, and it's an A-10 squadron, so uh, you get the call sign Killer Chick. But there is a story from one of my instructors. We were out on an air-to-air ride, which is not something that we do regularly in the A-10 and air to air think Top Gun dogfight. And uh, usually the instructor will kill the student most of the time. Uh, but I managed to sneak in a few more kills on this ride and uh, simulated, of course, killed my instructor. And so uh, that was one of the stories that was told as part of the wow. design. Very so, cool. Killer, killer chick, Casey for short. It's just much easier to say. Yeah, it's an awesome call sign though, because it you could get a bad one, right? I mean, people oh, can yeah. get some some bad ones, and that sounds yeah, like a pretty cool one. Yeah, and once you fly in combat with it, it's yours for life. But you know, if you get a bad call sign, really, the only way you can get rid of it is by paying it back. You know, buying kegs for the bar, something like that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and sometimes we like to do it just for fun. True. Who's in the room when they're making those decisions and having those discussions behind closed doors? The entire squadron, everybody, but what? You. So they send everybody, wow. out. everybody is in the room having a great time. And they usually have a whiteboard up with different call signs. Some of them are, you know, no way they'd ever give you that call sign. They're just for fun. 
uh, but the, the entire squadron's there other than you and you get sent out. So it's a bit of a surprise when you come back in, um, but it's a, it's a great night. It, it's obviously something that as pilots, we all look forward to, because I think it really means that you've, you know, you've got to that point, you know, you've reached that pinnacle. You yeah. finally have a fighter pilot call sign. Is it a democratic process or in the end is the squadron commander making the call? No, it's generally democratic based on a level of cheers for a certain call sign. Although a commander will step in and say, uh, absolutely not, you know, maybe draw the line through some call signs that are less appropriate. And uh, we call it the red flag test. Could you stand up on stage at red flag, which is a huge exercise out at Nellis Air Force Base and say, this is my call sign. If it doesn't pass the red flag test, then it's usually off the board. That is funny. So uh, one of the other guys I interviewed, um, Caesar, I think it was uh, Rodriguez, he was saying yes. that he mentioned red flag. And I asked, well, I've never heard of red flag. What's that? And the comments I got for not knowing what red flag was, was pretty, <laughs> pretty serious. So it's funny you bring that up. Okay. Um, maybe just before we jump off of, uh, off of call signs, what was the, the worst one you heard as you were in the room for, uh, that somebody actually got, I guess. Oh gosh, I've heard some really terrible ones. That or what are two can... or three that are bad? <laughs> uh, <laughs> some terrible ones that I probably can't even talk about on the on the, okay. on the podcast here. But I think I think some of the best ones are ones that tend to be acronyms, and so you're always kind of wondering what they are. Um, one of them uh, is an A10 pilot who, on a low level mission accidentally hit one of the guide wires that connects to a, a tower. And so his call sign was Frybat, flew right into big ass tower. Uh, so those are some fun, you know, those are always the fun ones. That's a great one. That's yeah. great. Yeah, those are, those are some of the better ones that are based on something stupid that you've done in the airplane. So it's, you know, generally it's a play off of your name or something stupid that you've done in the airplane. So thank goodness for me, I hadn't done, I'd done a lot of stupid things in the airplane, but nothing at that point that made the call sign. So. Right. Okay. Perfect. So now that that's out of the way, let's get to the origin story for the killer chick. If, if we look at the community you were in with A-10s and the Academy and everything you've gone on to do, I mean, it's a very type A community or at yeah. least people have this impression. So were you a type A as we look back to you as a kid growing up, uh, the alpha in what you were doing? What were you like as a kid? I'd say short answer is yes, uh, but not early on. I, I don't think I flipped that switch for me until I decided I wanted to go to the academy and become a fighter pilot. It was like that gave me the direction. But for me, that moment was, Ironically, I think um, when the space shuttle, space shuttle Challenger accident happened back in 1986, there was something for whatever reason in that moment that I really connected with of just doing something more important than yourself, something bigger than yourself. And um, I was also just enamored by this thrill of flight and ideas of being an astronaut. And so I, after talking to my parents, decided that was what I was going to do. I was going to the Air Force Academy. I was going to be a fighter pilot. And that for me flipped it. You know, that was the switch that turned me maybe into this type A person of really just working hard and starting to pay attention in school. I mean, even my parents were like, thank goodness you decided so early at a young age, because after that, I was just really focused on going after that goal uh, and working really hard at it. What was it that enamored you with flight? Was there a moment for you where th that you just felt this is the right thing? I, I you know, I, maybe I just thought it was going to be really cool to go do um, this idea of flight so much so that I asked for flying lessons for my 16th birthday. And so, you know, then now, you know, when I get to that point, I'm hooked. I mean, I flying for the first time and then I got to solo in a Cessna. I think I was 17 at the time, but flying for the first time and being in control of the airplane was just, I knew at that moment, it was like, oh, now I'm really hooked. If I wasn't hooked before, now I'm really hooked because I love the thrill of flight. I loved being in control of the airplane myself, uh, knowing that I could do it, even though my first couple landings weren't actually that good. I'm pretty sure I had multiple landings long <laughs> as I bounced down the runway, but, uh, 
I learned very early, any landing you can walk away from is a good one. It's a good one. Yes. And isn't that crazy that at 17, you can solo in, in an airplane? Uh, yes. I probably, I mean, I think of the things, you know, I look back now and 17 seems so young. Um, and the fact that I could solo in an airplane by myself and at, at San Jose International Airport. I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't a little airport. It was San Jose International Airport. And taxing behind like United and American. It was just no way. The fact, the fact that we let kids do that is amazing. But it, I, that hooked me. I mean, I just, I loved flying. Absolutely. So, so the challenger uh, moment was a big one for you. Yes. And, and somehow it's okay. I want to do something bigger than myself, but there are a lot of things you could go and do right. Yeah. That are bigger than yourself. Were your parents military? Like what what was it that made the Air Force or just the military service come into play there? Yeah, it's funny that you say there's a lot of things you can do that are bigger than yourself. My mom was an oncology nurse, which I, you know, I look at that as a tremendous amount of, you know, service and doing something more important mm -hmm. than you. Uh, my dad had been um, in the military only five years, so I didn't get to see your experience military life as a brat, but I got to hear a few of his stories. Once I, I decided it was something I wanted to do, he opened up a little bit about it. So he spent time um, at the, he went to the Air Force Academy as well, and then spent five years in service, but not a pilot, hates flying. Uh, but it was just that connection of knowing that how you get to be an astronaut is something that I talked to my parents about. And so he said, well, you know, most of the astronauts are pilots and a lot of them come out of the Academy. So that might be an option. I'm not sure he realized that it was something that I was really going to go do. I think it, there was this really? moment of like, well, we'll see, you know, we'll see if this is something she sticks with. And then I think when I really decided I was going to stick with it, you know, I think it was hard for my dad to see his little girl go off to the Academy, a place where when he was there, there were no women and it's hard. It's a really difficult school. And so I think there was part of him that, you know, it was hard for him to see his little girl go off to, to do these things. And, um, I'm sure it's been hard for them throughout my career, you know, um, flying a tens and flying in combat. And I'm sure that's really difficult for parents, but, uh, I, I was hooked and I wasn't gonna, I wasn't quitting on this goal. That's for yeah. sure. Man. So if, uh, maybe if you asked your parents, Hey, if, if Kim didn't go into the military, what was she going to go do? If not, like what, what was your other path you think? I, at one point I wanted to be a pediatrician, um, except I've realized that I don't really like blood all that much. <laughs> and so I deal with it with my own kids, but that whole, uh, career field would not have been yeah. for me. Got it. And then as you, as you're looking at the different ways you can go, did you look at all at the Navy or was it just like, Hey, I'm going in the air force to do this? It was only the Air Force. I, I didn't even apply. I didn't apply to Annapolis or West Point. I applied to a few other schools, mostly because my parents made me uh, so that I would have a backup plan, um, which I needed uh, because getting into the academy didn't come easy. Um, I actually got a rejection letter from the academy uh, in April of my senior year. And uh, I was totally devastated because I yeah. worked so hard for it. It was all I'd ever wanted. And then to get the letter from the academy that says, you know, thanks for applying, but um, you're you're essentially not good enough. I mean, is really what it wow. said. At least what I read into it is um, it's competitive, and you know, um, thank you for applying, but you know, try again next year. Uh, and so that was April of my senior year, and I was, I mean, I was crushed. I mean, that I had like that was everything that I had worked for and yeah. wanted, um, and the academy said no. Um, thankfully. Yeah. I had really supportive people around me and wrote the Academy letters every week um, to say, I'm still interested. I'm, this is still what I want to do. I can do 10 more push-ups. I can do five more pull-ups, whatever it was that I could do. I told them I had plans of showing up at the Academy on initiation day. Like if someone else decided they weren't going to get off that bus, I was going to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm here awesome. and I'm ready to go. Thankfully, I didn't have to do that. I got an acceptance letter um, in early June. So just a few weeks before we were to report. really, yeah, from, from writing these letters. I don't wow. know. My guess is somebody else turned down their appointment, but you know, 
I think, you know, something the Academy is looking for is somebody that's committed and really wants it. And so I don't know, maybe the letters did make a difference. Man. I know, I know the admissions office got them because when I was a freshman at the Academy, they called me up to the admissions office because they wanted to meet me because I had written so many letters that they were like, okay, we've got to meet this cadet who, you know, wrote us letters every week for months. Man. So whether it worked or not, I found my way there. So we might just take a tangent here because yeah. this is interesting to me. That's a cool story, first of all. And it reminds me, one of the guys I interviewed, Tom Shea, is a, a former SEAL, and he went to Bud's five times. Yeah. And for the fifth time, he waited outside of an admiral's office every day for a year at lunch, like, let me back in. That's and the awesome. guy was basically on the verge of kicking him out of the Navy yeah. entirely. And he was finally like, all right, I'm going to give you your last shot. Um and I've got a couple moments in my life where I feel like nobody was going to stop me from doing it, but it's not everything. Like, it's just yeah. a couple things I've done. And I wonder for you that maybe there's an impression for people, for the, for the type A's out there and the fighter pilots, like everything you approach is this 110% or were there a few things in life where you just knew, like, I really want this thing and I'm going to, I will stop at nothing to get it. Yeah, I think that whole path, I mean, I've, I think about just getting to the point of being a fighter pilot and it was something, you know, this is fifth grade when I made this decision and it was not easy. And I think about all the times that I could have quit, you know, I struggling to get into the Academy. I had some medical issues that I had to deal with while I was at the Academy and had to ask for an exception to policy from the secretary of the air force and go through some additional um, testing. I struggled with air sickness at pilot training. I mean, there were so many times yeah. where I don't know, it was just like, is someone telling me this isn't the right path or is this life testing me? And, you know, I look back about all the times I could have quit. And I think about all the opportunities I would have missed. I mean, if I had just quit when times got tough or I quit when things weren't going my way, or when people said, I'm not sure this is the right path for you. Um, but this was something that I wanted. I mean, I was just so committed to it and so driven. And maybe, you know, I think about it, maybe some of those moments were helped me actually be more vote motivated because if, if somebody's saying no, or maybe you're not good enough, or maybe this isn't the right path. I think for me, I'm like, well, I'm going to show you that it is right. I'm going to, I'm going to prove to you that I am going to, you know, that I am going to work my ass off to be good at what I can do, even if there are doubts. So I don't know. I think all those tough things made me better at doing hard things. I think all those hard, painful things, because they were painful at the time. I mean, it's not talk like it was easy, but it was, it was painful. And it was, it was those moments, I think, that probably made me a stronger person and a better pilot down the road. And then as we, as we look at how they narrow the pool of candidates for this profession, right? I mean, just getting into the academy is yeah. tough. Getting to fly, I'm sure is hard at the academy, like as you come out, getting fighter, fighter, you know, capabilities is another. So when it comes down to choosing the aircraft for you, was it always like, I want to go do A-10s? Did you figure it out over time? Like how, tell us about that uh, journey for you. Yeah. I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So even getting to pilot training, we start with roughly 30 people. And I knew that I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot and, and not everybody. And it's not for everybody. I mean, it, yep. it really is not, but I knew it was for me. And then I got to the point where it's time to really start thinking about the assignment, you know, which airplane do I want to fly? And there were seven of us in the fighter track that were getting assignments and I think over time, I just started talking to people about what aircraft they had flown and what they liked about it. But also through the course of my training, I realized that flying the air to air formation stuff, while it was cool, it wasn't really for me because where I really enjoyed flying was down low uh, at 500 feet cruising around and uh, doing those missions. We didn't get the chance to drop bombs or anything like that at pilot training. So I didn't really know anything about that. But the more I talked to pilots that had flown close air support and this whole concept of supporting our troops on the ground and knowing that the A-10 was absolutely the best airplane that could do that really led me down that path. And so more than an airplane, it was a mission. 
And, you know, the airplane, especially the A-10, you know, it's not your sexy, sleek fighter. I mean, it's a beast. It's nicknamed the warthog for a reason, but I love the mission. I absolutely love the idea of providing close air support. And this was pre 9-11. And so, you know, I'd, I, w- I didn't know how the world would change after 9-11, but for me, it was all about close air support. So um, it was a journey trying to get there, but it was really trying to find the mission that I felt um, most closely uh, aligned to. You, you mentioned something there that I, I also picked up on reading about you, which was kind of talking to former pilots along yeah. the way, like whether it's mentors or just trying to, to do your own research in a time that was like before the internet, as we know it today, right? Yeah. I, mean, I know it's sl- it was slow. We had it at that time, but, <laughs> but I think a lot of people, myself included, didn't really go out and ask those questions and really seek out that guidance. It sounds like you did. Could you talk a little bit about that of like, how you went about doing that? What you found most useful? It sounds like it helped you find the right aircraft for you. Yeah. I think, you know, what was interesting for me is there were very few fighter pilots at pilot training. And so we would only get really one side of the story. We heard from a lot of heavy pilots who, you know, could talk about their experience flying cargo aircraft or airlift or uh, refueling, whatever it was. And so it was almost a necessity to go find the fighter pilots who could talk a little bit about their airplanes. And the instructors there really encouraged us to do it because nobody knows your your airplane or your career, you know, unless you've been in that environment. You know, I can maybe talk a little bit about the other paths, but it's so important to hear personal stories. And that's one of the things for me, I think it's really important to share those stories too. I think, you know, we have a responsibility to share those stories with the next generation um, to help them in in their decision-making process. And so, yeah, for me, it was a necessity. It was about really finding out what was going to be the right fit for me. Um, Pilot training is a 10 year commitment. And so I tell people like, you want to find something that you're going to love, like go find something that you really want to do. And so I was all about trying to figure out the best way to do that and learning from other pilots about their experiences. That's cool. So I think you mentioned also, this is pre 9-11, but it's not that far pre 9-11, right? I mean, we're right on the cusp of, of that. So maybe if if timing wise, I understand you, you go through the academy then you go and do two years, I think two years of grad school, and then yes. you go to pilot training. And where are you at on 9-11? I am in A-10 training at davis Mountain wow. Air Force Base on 9-11. Um, I was actually flying a night mission. And so I was asleep in crew rest and the phone rang and it was one of the guys from my class. And, you know, my first thought of course is why are, why are you calling me and busting my crew rest? Cause I, you know, he knew I was flying nights. I didn't, I didn't get to even say anything because he just said, Kim, turn on the TV, you know, turn it on right now. And so I turned on the TV and it was about that time where the second plane uh, hit the World Trade Center. And I, I mean, I just remember that moment so vividly because I, it, it was no, there was no doubt in my mind. I mean, I, I knew we were under attack and it was just this realization that, you know, our lives were changed forever. And you know, my life as an A-10 pilot was likely going to change forever. And it did. I mean, we, I finished my A-10 training in December of 2001 and deployed in early 2002. Uh, and so it was, yeah, I mean, it was, you, we had to be ready. I mean, it was whatever little bit of training we had, it was enough and we were going to combat. So yeah, our lives did change forever as did many people's. How did the training change, if at all? I mean, I guess we're just talking a couple months between when that happens and you guys are finishing up the training. Did they, did you get a sense of urgency or any difference from from the instructors? I I think it was a sense of urgency to get us done and get us out the door. I knew already that I was going to Pope Air Force Base to the 75th Fighter Squadron. And uh, there was already talk about squadrons ramping up to deploy. And so it was getting us ready, knowing, I think more increased pressure. I mean, when you're sending students out the door, you want them to be ready. I mean, you're you're signing them off as they're ready to go. And so I think it was just increased pressure to get us done, to have the training done right and get us out the door to our units, because very likely we were going to be deploying very quickly. Wow. 
And, and you said you're deploying in O2. So you go yes. to Afghanistan right off the bat? Yeah, we started in Kuwait. Um, our squadron was tasked to deploy as part of Operation Southern Watch. But about this time, um, operations in Afghanistan were picking up and there was uh, a need for close air support. Uh, our unit was there shortly after Operation Anaconda. And so it was this realization that we needed a close air support aircraft closer than Kuwait because Kuwait to Afghanistan is uh, roughly five hours of flight time. So that's not a real quick close air support response time. <laughs> um, and so they decided very quickly that aircraft, they would start rotating aircraft between uh, Kuwait and Afghanistan. So we started in Kuwait for Operation Southern Watch and then they would just rotate pilots through. And of course, that's where we all wanted to be. I mean, Kuwait at the time was enforcing a no-fly zone. And for us in the A-10, it mostly meant flying circles and racetrack patterns uh, south of Iraq in a combat search and rescue alert role. So it wasn't very exciting. And that wasn't where the, the action was. The action was in Afghanistan. And that was our job. That was our, you know, our bread and butter is to fly close air support. And so that's what we wanted to do. So we were all anxious to go um, yeah. to, get our, to get our turn in Afghanistan. I will say just from the Apache pilot perspective, there's nothing worse than just like flying, a, just flying from A to B and, yeah. and, and practicing or, or well, it's flying. not what you train to do. You, right. You I mean, it. I think that's it. You yeah. want to be, you, if your team is on the field, you know, you want to be part of that. And so I think yeah. that's what we all felt was just this desire of, we knew as a 10 pilots that we could make a difference, right. We knew that we could save lives. And so we wanted in on that. We, that, that was, that is our primary mission is close air support. And so we wanted to be there. So if you can, could you take us to the first time you're flying in Afghanistan? Um, yes. How, how long have you been out of flight school? And again, you're a single pilot, right? I mean, you're in the, yeah. you're in the cockpit on your own. There's not somebody else who's going to help you out. And you were in training four months, like maybe four months before that. Yeah, it was, it ended up being about five months before my first combat mission. And, uh, I got the word, I think at breakfast one morning, one of the, uh, the senior pilots. So what they would do is pair a junior pilot with a senior pilot and, uh, for our combat missions. And so he came up and he said, all right, Casey, uh, we're going to Afghanistan, pack your bags. And so we had a couple hours and we, we, by this point, we had already been studying up on maps and missions and materials and rules of engagement and all of those things. Uh, and uh, we started the trek to Afghanistan, which was uh, ended up being a seven hour flight altogether, uh, refueled multiple times on the way. Uh, you know, there's no easy way into Afghanistan from Kuwait because you can't fly across Iran. So you're skirting around Iran, going through Pakistan and then into Afghanistan. And I remember this was my first air refueling um, overseas. I had done it in training, but I had to refuel um, multiple times to get to Afghanistan in flight. And I remember just being so nervous because I thought, you know, if I can't put gas in this airplane, I'm gonna have to divert on my very first combat mission because I couldn't get it done. Um, and I remember being very nervous, but you know, once the first time was done, it was like, all right, I got this. And then we made our way into Afghanistan and we were tasked to support some troops on the ground. It was a convoy escort. And we ended up not doing anything in terms of kinetic activity. We didn't drop any weapons. But I just remember the feeling of how reassured the guys were when we checked in. Like when we said, hey, you know, this is hog flight overhead. We'll be here for the next hour. It was just like this relief of like, there's a tons overhead, you know, nobody's going to mess with us. And, um, we, we, it was very quiet. We did escort meaning we kind of, we stayed overhead the convoy and then we would go ahead of them and look at the road and just make sure that there wasn't anything that looked out of the ordinary, but we essentially spent an hour flying circles in the sky overhead, the convoy, you know, at the time I, it was like, you know, I think everybody wants to employ and, and drop weapons and, but I, in hindsight, you know, looking back, I did many of those missions during my time in Afghanistan. And over time, I really understood the importance of it, of just being overhead, knowing that if, the, if something happened, we would be there. I mean, we weren't going to let them down. We were going to get them all the way to their next 
forward operating location and we were going to be overhead. And so I think just talking to the guys that we supported and knowing how much that made a difference, I kind of gave me a different view on that mission. So my first combat mission was, was eerily quiet, uh, yeah. no ordnance dropped. Um, and then having to land at Bagram Air Base for the first time was a whole experience in itself and probably more terrifying than the combat mission was my landing there. Because Why? Bagram at the Bagram at the time was like the Wild West. And I remember the controllers saying when we came in, you know, uh, just stay on the right side of the runway when you land. And I thought, well, that's an odd request, but okay, I'm going to listen. And the th- we didn't really fully understand the threat at the time. So we did this, what we called a whirlpool. So we'd go r- right over the top of the field, very high, and then whirlpool our way down to get to lower altitude very fast. So we could maintain our speed up and just stay right over the field. And I remember coming in for that approach and just trying to make sure I stayed on the right, fi- right side of the runway. And as I landed on the left side of the runway, I can see these like rocks and holes all over the runway. And then off the runway on the right side is these signs that say danger mines. And so I'm on this narrow little strip of pavement. On one side, I've got holes and rocks, like, you know, just FOD, foreign object damage waiting to happen. And on the right side, I have mines. So like if I blow a tire, you know, what's, I don't know, what's the least worst alternative? Um, But that was an interesting approach down to the field, an interesting landing, but that began my a uh, couple months at, at uh, Bagram flying missions in Afghanistan. If we can just nerd out for a second on the aviation yeah. side, what uh, what altitude do you start at when you're doing that whirlpool? Oh, it's been a while, but we started, um, I'm trying to, I'll, uh, we'll talk above ground level, yeah. probably at about 10,000 feet above the ground. And, and so you're literally like, you're just above the airfield coming yes. down. It's not like you got some nice, like final approach where you're coming in gingerly, Oh no. Like no, you're because spiraling that's just down. like, that's like coming in gingerly on a final approach at that time was like triple a, you know, uh, man pads waiting to happen. And so we would just come over the field and essentially do what we call a split S, which is roll inverted and pull, uh, to get down to a lower altitude. And then we'd have to like put out the speed brakes and everything to slow down. So it was a little sporty. Uh, we got, we got much better at it the more times we did it, but Man. it was a little sporty the first time around. How, how hard is that technically to do? Uh, the hardest part is not over speeding the airplane and being on your a- approach speeds when it times, comes time to put the gear and flaps down. So you get too fast and now you're just gonna screw yourself because you're not gonna be able to, to land the airplane. And then, you, and then you've just created more problems because now you gotta go around and now you're even more exposed to potential threats in the area, so. We got good at it over after, after time though. Yeah. Were you guys living in tents at the time at Bagram? Yes. We were living in these, um, uh, <laughs> I equate them to when I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy, we, um, in our basic cadet training, we had to put up these tents and they were just dusty with open flaps. There's no air conditioning. I mean, it's just cots and a big tent. It's really interesting because that was 2002 and there's one tent one giant tent for men, women, Ah, officers, enlisted, everybody. We're all in one tent. And so I've got my little cot in the corner and I've surrounded myself with ponchos to have a little bit of privacy. Um, And then, you know, I went back to Afghanistan several times, 2005. Now there's like officer, female only housing, you know, it's just, but back in 2002, I mean, it was, it was the wild west and, you know, but it worked right. We were we were maintenance and pilots all together. We were, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to be separated from my crew. And, you know, there just, there wasn't that many people there in the first place, at least on our little compound. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting living. We had baby wipes for showers. We oh. ate MREs. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it's a good thing for pilots to experience. Let's That's just true. It, that way. it gives you some, a little bit of, uh, of recognition of what our, our ground guys go through on a daily basis. I feel like you just, uh, held off many, an air force joke that was coming in the comments <laughs> of this. So that, uh, yes, I think that's I so true. It's so true though. <laughs> yeah. It really is. Um, so on the a 10, right. With the different weapon systems fr- from an Apache perspective, like there's a certain, um, almost 
pressure kind of recoil effect that you feel when you fire these things for the first time? What's it yeah. like firing those for the first time on that beast? Yeah. My, I, my favorite thing about flying the A-10, um, in, in addition to the mission, of course, but my favorite thing about actually flying the A-10 is shooting the gun, uh, because it's a 30 millimeter Gatling gun. If you've seen the pictures, the air, the gun itself is 19 feet long. So they built the airplane around this 30 millimeter gun. And so when you're in, when you're in A-10 training, we don't actually consider you an A-10 pilot until you've shot the gun. So you don't get your patch that says you're an A-10 pilot until uh. you've shot the gun, which is, uh, let's see, maybe 10 rides into the program-ish. But going out to the range for the first time, knowing that you're going to shoot the gun, I mean, we're all so excited. It's generally, we're all doing it on the same day. And so we're super fired up and nervous because you don't want to screw it up. Um, but the first time that you actually do it, your flight lead is tucked in right behind you to make sure that you're going to do everything correctly. Um, and the way we do it is we get set up in a rectangular pattern around a target. It's very, uh, academic in a way. And we roll in, we're at a 30 degree dive angle pointing at the ground. And I just remember, you know, fine tuning my aim point, putting it right in the center of our heads up display and then pulling the trigger and when you pull the trigger on the gun, I mean, it is immediate. Like you can, you can smell the gun gases. You can see it out in front of you. The whole jet shakes around you. And then ideally you see sparkles when your bullets impact the training target. Um, and so when you feel that the jet rumble, you're supposed to hold the trigger down for, you know, about a second. And a lot of guys will just immediately come off the trigger because it's so overwhelming. Um, but I just remember pulling that trigger for the first time. And it was just such a, such a sense of like, all right, now you've made it. Now you're actually an A-10 pilot. Um, it's just, it's hard to compare. I mean, it is just a, a really cool sensation. Um, but you know, the whole point of that gun is that it is incredibly accurate, incredibly precise. Um, but there's no better feeling than pulling that trigger, um, knowing that you can hit the target because it is very accurate. I think so many ground pounders right now are also saying that's their favorite thing about the yeah. A-10 as well, just I, for being yes. down there. Yeah. And it has a very unique noise. It doesn't sound like that from the no. airplane, but for guys on the ground, like when you hear that, you know, A-10s are nearby overhead. Um, and I think it's just a sense of relief, like that we're there and we can make a difference. Man, that's cool. Okay. Um, and just out of curiosity, do you guys set it for a 10 round? Like what is the burst round clip that you do when you're, so when you're in combat, it's roughly 70 rounds per second is what we shoot. And in combat, we'll do about two to three seconds. Damn. So you're looking to get a couple hundred rounds down on the target just for one burst basically. Yes. Yeah. Just one burst. So oh, man, yeah. It can go quickly though. I mean, we, uh, you know, we can run out of those things, but again, we fly in pairs. So you get, you know, you get your, your wing you rounds too. Okay, great. So that first time you're in Afghanistan, when you, so you fly from Kuwait into Afghanistan, you have this initial mission. Um, and you're there, you mentioned for a couple months, do you end up getting kinetic in that first deployment or does that come later? No, Afghanistan by Right after, I guess, spring of 2002 got very quiet, I think, as, uh, you know, the enemy regrouped and found its way to, to Pakistan. And so we did a lot of uh, convoy escort and overwatch missions. We did some support for uh, some special operations uh, missions. I, I think my only kinetic, if you will, was dropping a flare at night for special operators to help illuminate a landing zone, um, you know, which... You know, it made a difference. It was something, but yeah. it definitely wasn't the close air support that we anticipated. Um, that quickly changed a year later when we went to when we went to Iraq. Was there any, I guess, just your honest impression, like leaving that combat zone without having gone kinetic? Was there any frustration there, or was it just like, hey, we did this mission? Because truthfully, convoy escort, you probably save people just by being yeah. there. No kidding, we'll keep the enemy away. But what, what was your feeling as a fighter pilot at the time? I think there's always a little bit of frustration because we felt like we weren't um, doing the close air support that we had been trained to do. I think for me, the unique thing about being at Bagram was we were so close to 
um, the guys that we worked with and we, we interacted with them regularly, whether it was the conventional army or special operators, we got to talk to them about what we were doing. We sometimes would brief with them or debrief with them. And so I think there was a real rapport. So I think it took a while. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's frustrating to not drop weapons when that's kind of what you're trained to do. But I think we all realized over time what a difference we made just by being there. Got it. And sometimes it was, you know, a low pass, uh, a show of yeah. force with flares, and that was enough, you know. Um, it's just different, you know, knowing that the enemy will regroup the next day. And I think that that was the frustrating part more than anything. And then just before we jump to some of the more hairier moments, mm-hmm. as you as you leave Afghanistan that time after your first no kidding combat rotation, are you feeling at that time kind of yeah, this path I chose is the right one. This is where I should be. Yes. Um, I think, you know, 9-11 changed us in many ways. And for me, it was just this, you know, this idea that I started with of committing yourself to something more important than yourself. It was this commitment to service. I think, I don't think I recognized that in high school. I mean, as a teenager, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I really knew what service was. And so I think, after 9-11 and deploying to Afghanistan, I really connected with the mission and just service. And my husband and I were, we had, um, we'd been married for a couple of years at this point. And he was, he's also an A-10 pilot. And we were rotating back and forth where our squadrons weren't deploying at the same time. They, there was this no, there's no known history of a husband and wife couple flying A-10s. They didn't really know what to do with us. So they kept us in separate squadrons. And so we would like pass in Kuwait, you know, spend a few days uh, together and that was it. But I think, you know, looking back at the time, we were just so committed to the mission and what we were doing. And we believed in it so much um, that that sacrifice, like we, we understood why, right. We understood the importance of what we were doing, but I don't, I I did not recognize that as a young teenager. No way. It it definitely grew over time. (laughs) Right. Okay. So after you come back and, and you head out and, and maybe as you mentioned, your husband, which one of you two ends up dropping bombs first? Uh, he did. He actually flew in operation Anaconda. So he flew really, yes, he flew wow. a 10 missions in operation Anaconda and, uh, made a significant impact on the mission there. Um, I'll brag for a second. He was awarded yeah. three, three dif- distinguished flying crosses. Um, for his work in Operation no Anaconda, way. which is pretty impressive. So yeah, um, yeah, he he did, and you know, it's I think the nice part about being an A ten couple, if you will, is I got to learn kind of from his stories and yeah. his experiences and what he went through. Um, we we switched places because Iraq, uh, I was the one that got to deploy and dropped a lot more ordnance and ended up having a lot more <laughs> combat missions than he did. But yes, he was he was first. Man, and, and I will say, just people who listen to this podcast have probably only heard me mention this once, but Operation Anaconda, for those who don't know, definitely look it up, but huge battle right at the beginning of Afghanistan. A lot of the guys I went and served with in the 101st flew Apaches there. So I got to read about them. There's a great book, Not a Good Day to Die, maybe. Or yeah. I think that's it, um, which really details this and the A-10s role there. Like it really talks about everybody who is fighting in that battle. It's amazing. And I can't even imagine how you get three DFCs in that time frame, that's pretty special. That's it cool. was a it was it was a pretty impressive operation. Yeah, definitely. I'd suggest looking it up. It's uh, it's you know, obviously that was early two thousand two, and a lot of time has passed, but definitely significant time in in the A ten world in terms of what our capabilities were. Man. All right, so so let's then fast forward to if you take us to your first kind of kinetic operation. Could you just tell us where you were? what was going on? Like how much experience had you built up at that point in time? Yeah. So we, after coming home from Afghanistan, we turned pretty quickly and went to Iraq. Um, We deployed our same unit deployed in early 2003 uh, as the war was getting ready to kick off. We went back to Kuwait and uh, I remember landing in Kuwait that first time uh, after flying (laughs) across the pond, as we call it, the Atlantic ocean but flying in A-10s all the way there is a, a long, <laughs> a long trip. But I remember landing at Kuwait and it was so different from my first experience there because there were aircraft everywhere. 
I, I wasn't even sure how we were going to park. There were a tens as far as, <laughs> as you could see. The Marines were there. Uh, there was rescue helicopters there. I mean, it, clearly war was coming. I mean, it was just, this was March uh, of 03. Wow. Yeah. And we spent two weeks, um, you know, just kind of waiting, you know, waiting really to see what was going to happen. I think we all knew war was coming. Uh, we talked, you know, we, we talked about our preparations and what we would be, be doing. But at this time, I, I mean, I had 300 hours in the A-10. I was a very inexperienced wingman compared to everybody else that, you know, in general was a thousand hours or more. And so I didn't know if I was going to, if they were going to ask me to fly, I thought I might just sit in our mission planning cell the whole time. I really? didn't know. And uh, it turns out we needed every pilot we could get because we were constantly flying missions. And uh, once the war kicked off and again, you know, the, my very first combat mission into Iraq was uh, eerily quiet as we, we pushed into Iraq, I will never forget this line of dust that we could see as we watched our ground troops just press their way to Baghdad. And I think because initially the resistance just wasn't what we thought it would be until they made it further into Iraq. And so those first few days was just this dust trail and us being overhead. And I remember the first um, ground controller that we talked to on, on that first mission and he was like, look, it's your, it's Christmas. It's your birthday. It's Easter. It's whatever holiday you want it. If you can find an enemy vehicle, you can take it out. <laughs> and I remember we were just like, this is crazy. We're in, at the time we were held to a higher altitude. We, we had binoculars. We didn't have targeting pods. So we're trying to find, you know, enemy vehicles, anything. Uh, my flight lead ended up shooting a, a tank. Uh, an enemy tank with a, a missile, which was awesome to see, but there was nothing left. I mean, that was it. There was nothing for me. And so it was like, it was almost just like, wow, that was my first combat mission. And, you know, there was all this buildup, all this excitement, you know, we thought there was going to be all this resistance, which it, there's a good, there's goodness to this, right? We don't, yeah, we don't necessarily sure. want that close air support fight because it means that our guys are engaged with the enemy. So it was kind of a letdown, uh, my first mission, <laughs> uh, but that quickly changed. I mean, it, by, by maybe this first week, by the end of the first week into the war, we were dropping on almost every mission. Uh, and we were, it was, every mission was kinetic. Um, whether it was, we would find, you know, these areas that the Iraqis had abandoned, but there were vehicles and weapons and missile launchers, you name it, um, that we were tasked to take out. Uh, less close air support in terms of close contact with the enemy for our ground troops, which again is a good thing. Uh, but we spent a lot of that first couple weeks or so just taking out enemy weapons and material. That all changed once our ground troops got close to Baghdad. I mean, that was uh, things drastically changed uh, about early April timeframe as both the Army and Marines made their way towards Baghdad. And and when you're going in and taking out these, you know, pieces of equipment or and whatever it is at that time before they get close to Baghdad, is there a AAA threat in the area? Yes, there's AAA, there's missiles. In fact, it was, so at the time it was called the Super Mez, which was a missile engagement zone around Baghdad. But we would every day before we would fly, we would go in and we'd stare at this paper map on the wall and all the known or um, suspected missile locations would be plotted out on the wall and we would figure out our path. Um, I remember one mission being very um, nervous because they had reports of a SA-6, which is a pretty lethal surface to air missile, especially for an A-10. Yeah. Uh, and they said, look, you know, here's this area. We need you to go in there and take some things out. It was actually over on the Marine side of operations. Uh, thankfully, they sent in some surface uh, or suppression of the enemy air defense, some seed assets to go in with us um, so that we would have some protection. But it was, it was nerve wracking. The closer we got to Baghdad, the higher the threat for us. Uh, and we had guys uh, regularly talk about reacting to missile launches. Um, the AAA, you couldn't really see during the day. <laughs> Once I switched to nights, it was amazing. You realized how much they were actually shooting at us all the time and we just couldn't see it. Um, but what, yeah, what, why, threat, why is that, Tim? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, during the day, it's just, it's not, um, you don't see the flashes that go with it unless it's right near you. Um, but at night, you could just see it everywhere. I think, and a lot of it was they were just shooting it up 
you know, hearing aircraft noise, not necessarily specifically targeted us. Um, so I, yeah. I preferred flying in the day just to be, uh, <laughs> ignore that it's there. Did, did you guys fly at night with NVGs or was it thermal? No, we flew with NVGs. Okay. Man. Um, did you ever get painted with, um, radar or did you get hit with any of these surface to air missiles? Uh, we get painted all the time with, on our, Damn. on our radar warning system. So there was a lot of threat reacting and, and trying to assess, you know, um, what their capabilities were and what our capabilities were without getting into the classified side of things. But really just, it was as we pressed to Baghdad, I mean, our, the miss missions changed drastically. Um, and for me, that mission changed most significantly um, on April 7th of 2003. Um, by that time, we were thoroughly engrossed uh, in Baghdad. And so the tactic for us was we would take off from Kuwait, fly to Baghdad, and then they had us in these stacks around Baghdad because the situation on the ground at that point was so intense and that they just needed aircraft stacked up around Baghdad so that if somebody called for close air support, we were there and we were ready. So we would take off from Kuwait, fly up to Baghdad, we'd air refuel uh, before we'd go into the stack and then we just sit in the stack and wait to hold. And I would say the period of the, about the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th of April was really, um, I'm sure high stress and intense for the guys on the ground because for us in the air, it was equally so. Um, just in terms of the amount of the threat level and also the troops in contact, um, our guys being engaged with the enemy and just the constant calls uh, for close air support assistance. Um, April 7th for me was a, um, I would say the, I don't know, my life changing mission in the A-10. Yeah. I mean, it was what certainly happened? a defining moment for me. Um, we had, we were waiting in the stack as we did on, on many missions and that on April 7th, the weather, I mean, it was just clouds covering Baghdad as far as we could see. And so we actually, you know, we kind of were chatting just while, as we were waiting in the stack of, you know, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do anything today just because we, we can't drop through the weather at the time in the A-10. We didn't have those upgrades yet. And we had to be able to get below the weather. And then we got the call for troops in contact and we were like, all right, let's, let's figure out what we can do. Um, the guys were taking fire. They were on the North side of Baghdad near the North Baghdad bridge. Ground controller told us that our guys friendlies were on the West side of the Tigris river, uh, third infantry division. And then the East side was Iraqi Republican guard and they were shooting rocket propelled grenades into our guys. And so we were just pressed there as quickly as we could kind of hovering over this, the, what we knew with the target coordinates. And then my flight lead said, all right, Casey, I'm going to, I'm going to find a hole in the clouds and, and follow me through. And so I remember watching him, he just dove down through, disappeared through the clouds. And then I found my own uh, hole in the clouds and dove through. And as we got below the weather, I can I just remember this, seeing this firefight. I'd never been so low seeing a firefight. So it was very real. I mean, I could see the tracers and smoke and, it, you know, I could see bright flashes and just this huge firefight happening back and forth across the river. And then suddenly, as I'm kind of watching this firefight happening and we're talking about how we're going to set up to do a quick guns pass. I suddenly see these puffs of gray and white smoke. And now they're, now they're in the air right next to my cockpit and, you know, just bright flashes. And so, you know, it's this sudden reality of not only is there a firefight happening across the river, but now the enemy is shooting up at us too. So we decide we're going to do a quick pass of guns, just try to lay down some fire down on the enemy to try to take the pressure off on our friendlies. And uh, my flight lead goes first, he rolls in North to South and he's trying to get right underneath the North De Baghdad bridge where the enemy is hiding. So if you can picture trying to, this is a bridge, like a bridge that you might see every day in any city. And we're trying to get underneath the bridge, like underneath the overpass. Go under it. Well, we're trying to get our weapons underneath there. Got we it. don't want to fly under it, okay. but our weapons forward firing, we can get the guns there. So we're low, we're at an angle where we're trying to get at it. And my flight lead shoots first and the ground controller says, not effective. I've got to have you come in from South to North. So I break off my pass and we pull around to do another guns pass and we come in south to north. 
We're also now very predictable uh, because we're coming in south to north, coming off west over the friendlies to stay over the friendly location. We decide we're gonna do two passes each, that's it. Um, try to take some pressure off and then we've got to climb back up to get our energy back. A tends a bit of a pig at low altitude. Mm. And so we, uh, we decide two passes of guns and two passes of rockets and then we'll get our energy back. And uh, as I set up for my last rocket pass, I kind of refine everything, get my nose pointed right underneath the bridge, hit the weapons release button and then pull off target just to get away from the ground, away from the threat. And that is when I just feel and hear this loud explosion at the back of the airplane. And there is no doubt in my mind. I mean, I know I'm hit. It's like this fireball envelops the airplane. It dumps the airplane nose low. I can see Baghdad. It's like just getting closer in the front of my windscreen. And I instinctively just pull back on the control stick, just pull back, trying to get away from the ground and nothing happens. I mean, I pull back on the stick and nothing nothing happens. And so at this point, the ground is still getting closer and I know I might have to eject, but the thought of ejecting to where we were just strafing the enemy is, you know, not appealing <laughs> at all. And so it's this time stand still. I mean, I know I've got to make every second count. And so I quickly analyze the situation. I can see like my master caution lights flashing at me. I've got a caution panel down on my right side. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. And I remember looking down at it and these four lights at the top, hydraulic pressure and reservoir for the left and right sides, and they're all on. And right above that is my hydraulic gauges and they're both at zero. And so at this point, I've got two options. I look at my ejection handles and again, I'm you know not yet. That's the last thing I wanna do. And so thankfully the A-10 was built to take hits. And so I flip our backup emergency system put the airplane in manual reversion and the airplane thankfully slowly starts to climb out and away from Baghdad. And this is like, okay, I think I, I think I might make it out here alive. Oh, damn. Yeah. Where did you go? Like, did, did you, I mean, are you able to limp back to uh, Kuwait? Yes. Limp is a good term. I, at this point, um, I let my flight lead know that I had been hit. I tell him um, over the radio, I key the mic. So flying, you know, we, we aviate, navigate, communicate, right? We, we prioritize <laughs> on that mission. I think I communicated first because I'm pretty sure the very first thing I did was said, shit, two got hit, two got hit, um, which my flight lead told me later. He's like, well, we normally don't say that over the radio, but it was very appropriate at the time. <laughs> um, but I, I had told him that I was hit. And, you know, we talk about in an A-10, you're, you're solo, you're by yourself. There is nobody else in that airplane that's yeah. going to do anything God. for you. But I would say that my flight lead was so critical in that moment because the second I told him that I got hit, he immediately told me to start going west. In my little brain, I am focusing on just getting the airplane under control. I don't have enough brain bites for all this other situational awareness, but he does. And he tells me to move west because he knows that if I have to eject, my best chances of survival are to float down in that parachute, ideally over the friendly location. And I tell him that I'm in manual reversion. And as soon as I say that, uh, you know, he immediately, he tells me to continue putting out chaff and flare, but to emergency jettison everything off my airplane because I'm struggling to climb. I'm telling him that I can't climb and I'm in manual reversion. And he tells me to emergency jettison, get rid of all the other ordnance on my airplane. And so I do. Uh, and the airplane starts to climb a little bit. So that first, I don't know, minute or so is just pure survival mode. Yeah. It is get the airplane under control, but now get west, try to get some energy back, try to climb back up. I had lost altitude. They're still shooting at us. And so, you know, and the airplane is flying, you know, it's a pig. It's, it's struggling to climb. I'm not very maneuverable because I'm in this backup system, which is like, old school cranks and cables trying to control the airplane. And uh, it's rough. I eventually make it above the weather and kind of outside of Baghdad, which at this point, I, I feel like a, a little bit of relief, if you will, because to me, if I have to eject outside of Baghdad, I feel like I can maybe have a chance to evade and escape the enemy. Inside of Baghdad, I feel like 
uh, just not good. (laughs) And so I feel like a little bit of relief once we get outside the city. God. All right. So, so many questions here, but you mentioned as you started this story that this was life changing. I can understand why, but why do you say that in this case? Um, I think, you know, looking back, right. It's taken me, you know, it's taken me a while to kind of look back and, and realize everything that I've learned from this. But I think you always wonder, like in that moment, in that moment, when there's nobody else there to help you, like, can you do it? Can you respond under, under stress? Can you be decisive? Can you take action? And I, and I proved, you know, that I could, um, I, I, I was ready for that moment for a lot of reasons, but for me, it really comes down to being prepared and practicing. You know, I, I look back at the things where I, the reason I think I was successful in that moment was because I had, you know, I had prepared by knowing my aircraft systems. I had practiced by visualizing, we use a technique in flying called chair flying. Um, So kind of practicing and thinking through critical steps before you even get in the cockpit. Um, and then kind of planning for the worst case scenario. So I was ready for that moment, even though, you know, I said, I wasn't scared when it happened. The truth was I listened to the video afterwards and I can hear the fear in my voice, right? Of course I was scared, but it's all about what you do in that moment. Like, you know, can you take action? Can you respond under stress? And, and what in your life have you done to prepare you for that? So I think that was just a critical moment for me that where I proved to myself that I could do it. I, I knew what I had done to be successful in that moment. And now, by the way, I still have to get back and figure out what to do with this airplane. You know, do I get it back to friendly territory and eject? Do I take it back and try to land it? And having to make that decision, which to me feels a little bit like it has the potential to be the difference between life and death. Like, I can make the wrong decision, you know, and, and crash, um, being able to make a tough decision and feel confident in it, you know, I think really set me up for success for the rest of my career, the rest of my life as a follower, as a leader, as a person to be prepared in those critical moments, whether they're in your personal life or professional life, like I've proved to myself, I know how to do it and I can do it. But that man, that flight back, that hour flight back was the longest hour of my life. You know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen when I attempted to land. I, it's hard to stay focused for an hour. Like I thought about crashing. I yeah. thought about dying. We, we talked about it. I mean, we talked about, do I try to land in Iraq at Talil Air Base, which we at the time had owned, but there's one fire truck and no hospital. We discussed if I crashed. There, you know, that there's only one fire truck and there's no hospital. So, you know, the likelihood of dying was higher. I mean, those are the conversations we had on the way back. Um, I couldn't dwell on those. I had to kind of push those thoughts aside and really just focus on flying. Um, but I felt very good about the airplane. I had an hour to fly it. I had a very experienced flight lead with me who was providing me with this mutual support. And uh, so I felt, I felt good about it. Um, I also knew about the stories, you know, we were talking about stories earlier. I knew about the guys who had come before me in Desert Storm. You know, I knew about, sadly, you know, I knew about the aircraft crashes. We lost a pilot trying to land and manual reversion. And so I, I knew what happened. I knew why he crashed. And so I had those stories with me. And so that, you know, they, you know, they weren't there that day, but their stories were, I remembered those stories. We had talked about those stories. Um, and so that helped me. And then a really good flight lead, my wingman who was with me, kind of providing me that mutual support and talking me through it, you know, weighing the pros and cons, fully evaluating everything, and then feeling really confident that I could land the airplane. God. Did <clears throat> we, long hour. I should, I think there's this impression that, oh, okay, so you get hit, you climb out, and then everything's good because you're you're out of that that area of immediate danger, but it sounds like you're far off from that. Were you able, when you came into land, Kim, was it, was it just like a controlled crash or like a, a, a slow glide in? I mean, what did that look like? So it's interesting. So we, we only trained to fly in this backup mode once in, in our initial training. And it's just so we know how it responds. We know it's not the greatest to fly in but we only train to fly in manual reversion once. We spend about five minutes in it. 
and that's it. We don't, <laughs> we didn't ever try to land in manual reversion. Never. It's too dangerous. Like we, it's not a training. It's not something we can do in training. We didn't even try to do it in the simulator back then. That's all wow. changed now. That's, yeah. That is all changed now. Thanks to after. you. Is well, it the KC yeah, protocol wish, or something? I wish, <laughs> I wish I would have at least practiced it a few times in the simulator, sure. knowing that I could crash or, or land, but it's, it's deemed too dangerous. The checklist for manual reversion says attempt under ideal conditions. Never, I, you know, I don't know how it's ideal and you're in an emergency situation, but it's a different story. Um, but it talks about flying when you come into land to do a, essentially a Navy carrier landing, like a power on, no flare, just fly it all the way to the ground. Uh, very shallow approach, higher on speed to maintain control. And so that's what I was going to do. I did my controllability check as we got into friendly territory, meaning I got the gear down through our backup emergency system, all these backup systems that I had to use, make sure everything was good, and then decided to that I was going to go with the final approach. And uh, I came into that final approach, and I just remember, you know, everything seemed fairly smooth. I was very comfortable. And then I got very close to the runway into the ground effect, and the airplane just did this quick roll to the left. I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to crash. I thought the airplane was going to flip over on its back wow. and I wouldn't have time to eject. And, you know, this is all happening in probably microseconds. And I just yank the stick back to the right. It levels out and I continue with the approach. And, uh, I kept my hand off the throttle knowing that I didn't want to pull the throttle back as I always do on landing to slow down. That's kind of our normal procedure. Um, but I knew if I did that in manual reversion, it would cause the nose to dump and then airplane to potentially cartwheel down the runway. So power on Navy style landing and uh, just flew it right into the ground. And uh, it, you, you asked controlled crash. It was probably one of the better landings I have ever done. <laughs> At you least probably never so focused on a landing. So focused on landing. I've never spent that much focus on actual, on actual yeah. landing. Um, you know, but I got the airplane on the ground and I just remember feeling like such an intense feeling of relief. And I, I, I need to find a better word because relief is just like this understatement. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, a weight of like, I did it, you know, like I'm safe. I'm on the ground. At this point, the airplane's pretty slow rolling down the runway. I don't have brakes. I don't have steering. And uh, I, we have a backup emergency braking system. So I just slowly apply, apply the brakes and, and bring the airplane to a stop. But Whew, yeah, it was, uh, that was definitely the most terrifying moment I've ever had in the airplane. Um, but also a true testament to the durability of the airplane, you know, yeah. it, it got hit by a missile yeah. and, you know, incredible damage and, uh, got me safely back home. And all the backup systems seem to have worked, yeah. you know, like all these things that you, you might wonder, is this going to work when I need it? They, they worked. Yeah, That's backup great. flight controls, backup power, backup braking, backup getting the gear down. Everything yeah. was an alternate procedure uh, that I had not used before, and uh, they all worked exactly as advertised. So, as you hop out of the aircraft, do you at that moment have this feeling like this is a life-altering event, or you realize it later? Like in your mind, are you thinking, "I'm lucky to be alive right now"? Does it change your perspective on life at all? How are you feeling yeah. at that moment? I definitely felt lucky to be alive. I mean, I, I was still <laughs> super hyped up on adrenaline yeah. uh, to be honest, but I, I, you know, at that point, I just wanted to see the damage. I couldn't, I hadn't seen any of it from, from the cockpit. I couldn't tell what the damage was like. And so I it was just, you know, I hopped out of the airplane. There's like 10 Marine firefighters all staring at me like, what the hell just happened? And I'm thinking the same thing. And I walked back to look at the back of the airplane and it is, I mean, it's dripping with hydraulic fluid. There's holes. There's probably 600 holes in the airplane. There's a giant hole about the size of a football in the back horizontal stabilizer. The back of the airplane is charred. Like a fire happened. It's covered. You know, it's just, I had no idea the amount of damage this airplane took. Their, their pieces of the airplane are gone. Like the, the outside <laughs> structure of the airplane is gone. And I can see that the dark honeycomb underneath. I mean, it is just, it is uh, more damage than I expected. Um, so yes, I feel very lucky to be alive. Uh, I, I just, you know, 
my first thought is I need to go find my crew chief because I just destroyed his airplane. I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Like, what do you say? I'm, I'm really sorry. I just destroyed your airplane. So I got a ride over to my parking spot because I, I had to leave the airplane on the runway. And there's my crew chief. And he, you know, he just has the biggest smile on his face. And he's just like, ma'am, welcome home. I didn't have to say anything. I That's just, awesome. It was awesome. Um, my crew chiefs were awesome. I mean, that airplane flew exactly like it was supposed to. Um, Man. I don't think the reality of what happened sunk yeah. in. I, I honestly think it took months. I think I compartmentalized a lot of what happened on that mission because we were still flying in combat. There were still missions to fly. And I didn't, I didn't have time to really think through the fact of what I had just survived and what could have happened. And uh, I just couldn't go there while I was deployed. And so I, I didn't really unpack all that till after I got home. Was, was there a thought at all of maybe I shouldn't go back up again? No, I, no, I think, you know, I, I have a, I, I wrote in a journal, while I was there, someone gave me the idea of, you know, Hey, write it, you know, take some notes while you're such in a good combat. idea, you know, thank goodness I have it. Cause I have all my thoughts from that night. I wrote it. I, I pages that I wrote about that mission. Um, I think I was definitely nervous about getting back in the air, but there's a war going on. I mean, there are guys on the ground that needed our support. We needed every pilot we could get. And I think my flight lead, um, recognized that I needed a little bit of downtime. So on April 8th, which was the day after this mission, he signed us up, uh, well, he runs, he ran the schedule, but he signed us up to sit, uh, combat search and rescue alert, which normally is a down day. I mean, it's a, you sit in a shack next to the runway, you rest, you read books, you play video games, whatever you want to do. And so it was supposed to be kind of like decompress. And then the alarm sounded and it was not a drill. We got yeah. launched because an A-10 pilot had been shot down in Baghdad. And so, wow. yeah, so we, we ran out to the jets as fast as we could. We like got our gear on, hopped in the jets and just took off. And then we spent 30 minutes just gathering information, you know, where was the pilot? What shot him down? Where were the closest helicopters that we could bring in to pick him up? I did not have time to think about the fact that I was going right back to Baghdad, you know, right where I had escaped my own shoot down. And so maybe a good honestly, thing. No, like, yes, honestly, the best way to get back in the airplane, I didn't wow. have the time to think about it. It was like, you know, get back on the horse again. Right. Like it was a great way to be back in the airplane and have a mission that was so important because yeah, somebody those, needed you. Yeah. Those guys were there for me the day before. And I was going to do the same for this pilot. I mean, he was on the ground and, um, Thankfully, we made it about 30 minutes into Iraq and we got the call that we could turn around. And we were at first we were like, um, hell no, we're not turning around. There's a pilot on the ground. I mean, I don't know what we were thinking. The, the controllers have radar. They can see us. They can tell yeah. that our airplanes aren't turning around. <laughs> so they eventually are like, all right, Sandy, uh, you can turn around. The pilot has been picked up. And we're like, he's been picked up. Well, later we find out uh, a friend of mine, a, another A-10 pilot. So we found out the story he ejected, obviously incredibly scared, grabs his parachute, his weapon, and, and runs for a ditch. And he can hear a whole lot of commotion, noise, vehicles. And he, he thinks that the enemy is like, they're coming for him. He's about ready to get captured. And he hears, hey, pilot dude. So he immediately knows they're American. Turns out the ground convoy had been going past, saw him, ejected, and went over to get him. So he was very That's lucky. great. Um, so that mission didn't last long, but it was a great way for me to get back in the air. And it was just, yeah. you know, get back into it, get back into the fight, knowing that there's a war going on and, and they need every pilot, a 10 pilot they can get. And you, you mentioned something else during this story about the video and listening to it afterwards. And this yeah. is something that I think people on the ground often don't have the opportunity or the unfortunate circumstances yeah. to endure during a some type of incident like this in the aviation community, like you sit in a room, I would imagine with your peers yeah, and everybody listens to what you did and they watch oh, yeah. it like you're <laughs> watching an NFL game the day after and you're on the yes. team, like, Hey, you missed this block or you should have done yeah. this. So yes. did that happen for you? We did. We debrief, uh, after every oh. mission. Yeah. So this mission was no different, you know, after kind of coming in and doing the initial debrief with our Intel team, um, so they could get the word out about what yeah. had happened. 
um, we sat down and watched the video and kind of debriefed it all and talked through it all. Um, it was, it's really, it was really interesting to go back and watch because I think um, like people talk about when they're in a car accident and time slows down, there was 20 seconds that passed from the time that I got hit to the time that I was in manual reversion. I felt like that was wow. like five minutes. Like I just wow. felt like all yeah. this time, it was 20 seconds. And so we went back and we watched and we debriefed it and talked about, you know, what we did well, what we could have done better. And I think the most important thing about a debrief, right, is we talk about our objectives and, and this mission essentially was a success, right? We, you know, we supported the troops on the ground. Yeah. I had landed safely, but there's always little things that we could have done better. And we talk about those things and think about what we would do differently the next time. We talk about the things that we did well, right, that we want to repeat. But then we walk out of that room and we share those lessons, right? They're not yeah. just my lessons and my flight lead. Like we shared them with the entire A-10 community. So A-10 pilots around the world, we shared the lessons of flying and manual reversion and things that we could do differently. And I think that's really important is, you know, anytime you face a stressful event or a difficult situation, it, it's worth a debrief. And it could be a five minute conversation of how do we do there, you know? What do we do well? What can we do different the next time? But that debrief is huge. It's so so much part of our fighter pilot mindset of what we do to help focus on this idea of continuously improving and always getting better and learning from your mistakes and kind of changing the way we look at mistakes because it really just, you know, yes, they're painful when they happen. And yes, you know, people will point them out and everybody's around watching your mistakes and that, that part sucks. Don't get me wrong, but walking out of there, knowing how you can learn from those and then, you know, to, to do better the next time, uh, is really critical. So yeah, that mission was no different. We watched Jeez. the film, we critiqued it all. Painful, painful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I, I want to get to some of your post service work, but just, I, I, I want to touch on maybe just one more story yeah. from your time in combat. Um, and I, I would kind of leave it up to you to choose, Kim. And I'm I'm just thinking, I would imagine you've had a couple danger close shots, um, or if there's a particular mission that you just think back on from a leadership perspective, or it, it was difficult, or maybe it was a, a routine mission that, that you just think about sometimes. If you could just take us to maybe one more yeah. operation that you were on. There's so many. I mean, there's so many in different, I think in many ways, I mean, I will tell you this particular mission on the 7th of April was, I think drove home a lot of things for me. And I was thankful it happened so early in my career. Um, you know, I, because I realized the importance that a, a flight lead, you know, a, a wingman has, yeah. um, in helping you and giving you that critical support. Like I said, everything from that mission, I went and, and kind of adjusted how we did things in, in A-10 training and how we taught our young pilots to deal with surface to air threats and how to make time critical decisions. So were the, there were so many lessons that came from that, but I was a follower, right? In that mission, I was a wingman, I was a young yeah. wingman. So I wasn't leading that mission, but I'm really thankful it happened so early in my career because it, it changed me as, a, as an A-10 pilot from being a two ship flight lead to a four ship flight lead, you know, to an instructor in the airplane. And then later in life being a commander and leader of large organizations. Um, I think if I would talk about one other mission that comes to mind, and I think this, this one is now very different because now I'm a flight lead, I'm an instructor and an evaluator yeah. in the airplane. I have thousands of hours in the airplane. I've, this is my third combat mission. And I was leading a four ship of A-10s into Afghanistan. Um, we had started as a 12 ship and a few airplanes had broke along the way. So I was bringing the last four A-10s into Afghanistan. Maybe a common theme here, but the weather was terrible. Um, <laughs> we uh, were supposed to stay VFR, visual flight rules, meaning we're not supposed to fly into the clouds. Um, but there were clouds and coming from Pakistan all the way to Bagram, or through, again, um, through Pakistan and into Bagram, you, you know, there's, there's nowhere to turn around. There's nowhere else to land. So we did the best we could. And then they give us procedures. If you have to go in the weather, here's what you do. But there's no radar at the time. There's no other, we don't have radar on the A-10. So we can't see what's out there. Uh, and there's no big controllers out there 
watching us either until we get closer to Bagram. So I'm leading this warship into um, Bagram we're, and we're very close. We're about a hundred miles, maybe less outside of Bagram. And we're in the weather, we're following our procedures and, uh, and I lose contact with my number four airplane. I just, I can't hear him anymore on the radio. And I remember, you know, a Afghanistan is, ha has beautiful mountains. <laughs> they're also <laughs> deadly. I mean, they're very high. They're at the altitudes that we in the A-10 fly. Now, if he's, my number four is following the procedures, he's fine, but I can't hear him. He's not responding to anything. And at this point, I don't know if he's crashed. I don't know if he's had an emergency, if he's had something wrong in the airplane, or if he's just, there's something wrong with the radios. But I'm also leading a four ship and I have three other airplanes that I have to get on the ground safely. And so we spend a few minutes, I'm, you know, constantly, you know, hog four, hog one radio check, hog four, hog one radio check. But as I'm doing this, I realize I'm not focused on leading my airplane. The other airplanes are following the procedures. And so kind of have this quick moment of reflection of like, I've got to let somebody else deal with that. And I have to, I have to lead this warship down to the ground. And so um, I passed it off to my number three to continue to try to contact him. And I think all of us at this point, we're now getting very nervous. You know, did we just lose number yeah. four? Did he pack it into a mountain? We don't know, but he's not on the radio and he should be. And uh, we're just trying to keep us all safe at this point, make sure that we're separated, that we're separated from the mountains, that we're not going to hit each other. Um, and, and now I realize, you know, I'm kind of my back to my basic lead in crisis um, mantra, if you will, that we learn early in our pilot training, which is aviate, navigate, communicate. And so I, I go back to that. I, I've got to fly my own airplane first. I've got to get my other three airplanes in a safe space. So, you know, I've got to get them down to the ground by navigating clearly. And now it's time to communicate and tell the controllers at Bagram, like, look, we need help. We're not, we're not seeing number four. We're not hearing number four. What can we do? Um, and so we just, I, we, I, I'm getting everybody in to try to land um, through the weather, which is dangerous. And, you know, when we don't have radar, can't see the ground, don't know, you know, exactly where we're going to come out of the weather. And thankfully, at this point, we gain control. We, we talk to our controllers at Bagram and they can start picking us up. Um, but I still can't hear number four. I have no idea what's happened to him. And uh, we eventually um, pop out below the weather. And I can, I can only see three airplanes at this time, but he's above us and behind us. And slowly, as we get down lower, I start to hear this crackle over the radio and he comes up on radio. Uh, and uh, it's a huge relief, <laughs> another word relief that doesn't seem to yeah. fit the situation because I was, honestly, I was terrified that I had lost my number four airplane. And no matter what had happened, I was still responsible, right? I was the leader in this, you know, I, I had to own it no matter what happened. But kind of going through that whole situation, which again, only lasted probably, you know, five minutes in the scheme of things was terrifying. And the thought of losing one of your wingmen um, and I would have been responsible. Um, but I, you know, again, I kind of go back to those early missions, you know, the things that I learned about decision-making and leading and just trying to be calm in a crisis. And if, if there's one thing that A-10 pilots do, I think really well, is that we have the ability to remain calm, whether it's with our wingmen, even though I was terrified that, you know, something had gone wrong, I had to keep my entire four ship calm. And then when we're in those moments where the guys on the ground are screaming for fire and screaming for us to get in as quickly as we can, to be calm and to remain calm and composed and to kind of go back to the aviate, navigate, communicate, right? I still have to fly my airplane. I have to know where our yeah. friendlies are. I have to know where the enemy is so that I don't harm our own troops on the ground. Um, and then communicate and let those guys know, look, I've got it. We're going to keep you safe no matter what. Um, what so happened many to lessons, number four? So many things. What's that? What happened to number four? Like what, I, he... it, In the weather, up high altitude, something happened with his radio. Oh. We still don't know. So he then, but he, yeah, he obviously was, sorry, I left you hanging there. <laughs> no. Uh, no, he, he eventually came up over the radio and uh, he, he didn't even know anything was wrong. He was like, why can't I talk to you? Why aren't you talking to me? You know, so it was something wrong with his radio, but we eventually got him on the ground. Um, 
you know, I remember rolling in at, at Bagram and I have a picture of this, of these the A-10s taxing in and then it's like snowing. I mean, it's just terrible weather. And I'm like, how do we even make it down in that? And, uh, but it, it took me a while to like, you know, um, I think losing somebody that you're responsible for was, I mean, it was terrifying. Yeah. Um, and just knowing that that would have been on me, no matter what, right. I think as leaders, it's always on us, no matter what happens, we're responsible. So, um, but learning kind of that flight leadership of always having a wingman and supporting each other in various moments, whether it's getting hit with a surface to air missile, whether it's leading a four ship in the weather, whether it's just being overhead, some guys on the ground who need our help. Um, I think being the leader that's calm in the chaos is really critical of just helping to keep it, the rest of the team calm. I love it. So as we, as we look back at some of these scarier moments that taught you a lot, and I think it's evident that you carry these over into your post-military service and what you do now as a keynote speaker, leadership development, also some of the last assignments you did in the Air Force, it looked like were in this vein of, of creating leaders and how you manage in difficult situations. I, I want to touch on that a little bit, but I also wanted to make sure and we can edit this out later, Kim, if you don't want to go here, but I, I think what many people would say is the elephant in the room. You're at the Air Force Academy in the 90s. I don't know how long they had had women at the academy, but you're in a male-dominated institution. You then go into flying, which is largely a male-dominated uh, environment. Then you go into fighters, which is the alpha male environment. So I, I would I open this question to how you'd like to, to move with it, but specifically looking at leadership development, if you have somebody, whether it's another young woman or somebody who's an outsider in a community asking you, how do I do this? How do I make it in this community? What advice do you give them? You know, I think for me, I, when I went to the Air Force Academy, when I started out, we were at about 12% women there. And so it was obviously a very male dominated environment. But, you know, getting into the academy was really hard for me. You know, I obviously had faced a little bit of rejection. And so once I got there, it was all about proving myself. Not so much proving myself because I was a woman, but proving myself to prove that I had earned my spot and that I could do it. And I ended up graduating as the number one cadet in the military order of merit. And towards the top of my for, class. For your whole class? Yeah, so, I mean, I was like, all right, <laughs> I needed to go back and tell the admissions office, all right, thank you for taking a chance on me. Yeah. You know, I had, I had done it, but I had come from this environment of being, you know, just, there were four women in my squadron of cadets. And so it, it already had been this environment of being so few women. And then when I went into the fighter community, I was the only woman. When I walked into my fighter squadron on day one, I was the only female fighter pilot. There were other women in, in some of the other areas in the squadron, but I was the only female fighter pilot. And at the time I was one of just 43 women in the entire Air Force that were fighter pilots out of about 3,500 fighter pilots at the time. So the numbers were very small. I put a lot of pressure on myself um, to do well that was pressure that I put on myself, you know, and these are my words, but I didn't want to ruin it for all the women that followed me. And so I put that pressure on myself. I think in truth, you know, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, when you walk into a new unit or into a new team or to a new organization, there is proving yourself. There is showing that you're credible and capable and no matter what it is that you do. But my advice to people is not to put so much pressure on yourself. I mean, go out, be good at what you do, be credible, work hard, have a good attitude, but don't put so much pressure on yourself. I mean, I was, I was afraid of making mistakes. I was afraid of failing, you know, because I thought that I had this burden to carry. We all make mistakes. We all fail. I made plenty of them along the way. I made plenty of mistakes in pilot training. I had failures in pilot training. But part of, you know, part of what they're looking at is how you respond in those moments. You know, how do you respond when you make a mistake? How do you respond when you fail? Can you get back up again? Can you, you know, do you have a good attitude and keep working, learn from those mistakes? And so I think my advice to really anyone is to just work hard, be good at what you do, 
and don't put so much pressure on yourself because you will make mistakes. You will fail. You need to think about how you're going to react in those moments. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that, that's probably the advice that I wish I would have taken or had when I was younger. And quite honestly, advice that I still have to remind myself of today. Like it's still not easy, right? <laughs> I still put pressure on myself yeah. to do well. Um, so advice for young and old alike. Yeah. As we, as we then look at what you're doing now, I have a few questions around it, but I wonder if you might just share, uh, give some context to the leadership development side of your, of your yeah. life, but both following the tail end of your military career and what you do now. And then sure. I'd like to ask just a few questions about that. Yeah. You know, I spent, um, my entire career flying A-10s, but I also had the opportunity to do some tremendous leadership opportunities as well and commanding squadrons and groups. So talking about a hundred people to over a thousand people. And I found that I absolutely loved being a leader and having the ability to impact people's lives and connect with them and make a difference. Just like on the ground in the A-10, I know we made a difference. And I feel like as a leader, you have a, a responsibility and an opportunity to make a difference as well. And I, I loved it. I um, I enjoyed that opportunity. You know, I, I think probably most important was this idea that you can both connect with your team on a human and personal level, and you can also hold people accountable and push your team to excel. Those are all things that I learned from flying. Uh, those are things that I learned in my early days of being a fighter pilot. At the very end of my career in the Air Force, I got asked to go back to the Air Force Academy and take on the role as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. And I couldn't think of a better way to end it. I mean, it was for me, it was coming full circle and going back to an, a place that really changed me and um, helped me be the person that I am today, but also to help influence the next generation of leaders. And so we focused a lot on developing leaders of character at the Air Force Academy and helping young men and women um, to be ready to go out right as a second lieutenant in the Air Force or Space Force to be in a position to lead young men and women into combat. And so we're asking a lot of them on day one. And so I wanted to be a part of that. That leadership, develop, leadership development role was very important to me. And so now that I'm out of the Air Force, uh, recently retired this year, um, I am continuing on that path. Um, I'm continuing on the path of sharing stories. Um, I am a keynote speaker and share stories about my combat experiences while also talking about some of the roles that I've um, had in leadership spaces and learning how to lead with trust and courage and vulnerability. And also taking that to the leadership development side as well. I'm working with a company, a team um, called Victory Strategies, which is a leadership development firm. We're comprised of, I would say, elite military performers like special operators and fighter pilots, but also Fortune 500 executives and elite athletes and entrepreneurs. Uh, and we're all focused and passionate about leadership. And so it's trying to share some of our stories and our experiences and share that with the corporate and business world as well. And so, yes, it is different than flying the A-10, and I do miss flying the A-10. Um, but I love, I love the next chapter as well. It's an opportunity to do something different and a way to continue service just in a different way. And so you've got what I would imagine is a lot of reps in terms of yeah. growing leaders, right? And watching this, mm -hmm. both growing up yourself as a leader in the Air Force, but then leading as a commander mm -hmm. in some difficult situations that we've talked about. Then in, in this role, like overseeing leadership development at a military academy, and now what you're doing. So I wonder, and I think in particular, the reason I'm bringing this up, I think people in this audience appreciate some of these skills they can pull out. Are there any item or characteristics that you see, what, maybe one or two that are particularly difficult for young people to grasp when it comes to mm -hmm. leadership that you might point give some advice on? So I think to me, it comes down to leading with courage. And when I talk about leading with courage, I'm not talking about big heroic courage. I'm talking about the small things. It's about showing the human side of leadership and, and taking the time to connect with your team. I think there's that side of it. It's hard to 
to be vulnerable and put yourself out there. And, and as a leader, we often have to show trust to earn it, right? Like we have to give our team trust and trust in their expertise, trust them to do their jobs. And then we can earn trust. I think that leading with courage also extends to being able to have the hard conversations, to make the tough calls, to hold people accountable. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I see with younger leaders is we want to be liked. I mean, that's just part of our nature. We, we want to be liked. But for a leader to truly be effective, they have to have the courage to do the hard things, right? Have those hard conversations, provide feedback. There's a way to do it. It doesn't have to be harsh feedback, but you owe it to your team. You owe it to yourself to hold yourself accountable and hold your team accountable as well. That all takes courage. None of it's easy, right? It may be simple in this idea, but it's not easy to go out there and have those tough conversations, to hold people accountable, to give the feedback. Um, and so to me, that's what it comes down to. It's, it's leading with courage, meaning you, you have the courage to connect with your team, to show trust, but also to hold your team accountable and to hold yourself accountable as well. Love that. And for myself, having worked recently at a big tech company, is there any advice or guidance you give to companies as they're trying to develop leaders? Because I feel like the military, it's just part of the process in how they develop officers, but it's not well, yeah. second nature in corporate America. I think, you know, the one thing that the military, the one thing, there's many things that the military does well, but the one thing that I will point out in terms of this discussion is we spend time on leadership development. I mean, we, we set aside time, we set aside resources to focus on leadership development. I, I don't necessarily see that all the time with the business and corporate world. It's just, it's hard to find the time. It's hard to find the resources. There's a finite amount of time and resources. And so how do we set aside time to do leadership development? You know, that, that, that's hard. Um, but I think that's one thing that I see the military does very well is we set aside time, we make it a priority. We tell it, our team it's a priority. And I think as leaders, we can set the example with this, right? We, we should never stop growing as a leader. We should always have the ability to learn new things, try something new, get outside our comfort zone, for me, it's this idea that, you know, I always have something to learn from others. I can, I can never stop growing and learning. I think we can take that into the business and corporate world as well. Leaders can set the example, whether it's, you know, taking the time to make leadership development a priority, whether it's coaching or training in, in whatever way works for an organization, make it a priority, focus on it. Even if it's, it's, even if it's internal, you know, find ways as a leader to take the time to sit down and talk with your team, set expectations. We talk a lot about commander's intent in the military. Yep. Um, you know, Simon Sinek talks about a why. Taking the time to sit down with your team and understand, understand um, making sure they understand your intent and the why behind what you're doing. Those are all things that I think help develop leaders because when they understand your intent, they understand a why, then you can empower them to make their own decisions, to take action in those critical moments. But you have to empower them. You have to trust them to enable them to do that. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that we can, we can learn from the, the military example there um, to bring into the corporate and business world as well. So true. So as we round out here, there are a couple of questions I like to ask everyone. There's yeah. just one I wanted to throw in for you as we are wrapping up with, um, in particular for you which was, do you think looking back that you would have made it as far as you did if you didn't get rejected early on at the <laughs> academy? No, I honestly think no. I think it set me on a path of like good or bad of proving myself, right? Yeah. Of like, um, I think sometimes when you are, somebody doubts you or you, you face rejection, I think you want to work that much harder to prove yourself. I worked my ass off at the Air Force Academy because I felt a little bit like I had to prove myself to prove that I belonged there because I, you know, had received that early rejection letter. That set me up for doing well enough at the academy to get a pilot slot, you know, to have to overcome some medical issues and to be able to go get a pilot slot and have the opportunity to fly. 
Well, when I got that exception to policy, it was a letter from the secretary of the Air Force that said, we expect a lot of you. I mean, the, the pressure wow. was on. Like I had to prove myself again, like, hey, they took a chance on me. And so I think every step of the way, those hard things help me get where I am. Um, I worked really hard. I mean, none of this came easy. I'm a huge believer in practice and preparation. And, and that helps in those moments of fear, those stressful moments of getting hit with a missile over Baghdad, not that we all need to experience a life or death situation like that. But in those crucial moments, I think the reason I was successful was because I had worked hard. I had practiced, I had put in the work, I had done my homework, I had prepared for all of those things. Probably because there were those bumps in the road along the way, you know, where I felt like I had to prove myself and work hard. So I think it really set the stage, probably the trajectory for the rest of my career of, you know, it's not going to come easy, but I'm going to work at it because yeah. it's what I want. And then you've got big shoes here because I get some great <laughs> responses on these from pilots, but <laughs> is there, is there anything you used to carry with you on missions that had sentimental value, a good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that you had to have on you? Uh, I, I don't know that it's, um, it's probably not unique, uh, to many pilots, but I, I carried a, a flag with me on every single mission. Um, not a, not a full flag, but just a small, uh, size flag. And it, I flew it on every mission that I ever flew in the airplane, not yeah. just in combat. Um, if you look at pictures of an A-10 up in the cockpit, we have a space where we can put things. And so this was a, a um, basically eight and a half by 11 flag that I slid right on the side of my cockpit. And so every mission that flag was displayed. Um, it's been flown in combat. It's been flown on training missions. It's been flown on missions where I excelled. It's been on missions that I uh, did poorly. And so um, I don't know that that's necessarily unique uh, yeah. to, to many pilots. I think a lot of us fly with flags, but it is one that I've, I have carried with me um, from day one of flying the A-10. And so it's cool. got a lot of uh, sentimental value, if you will. Um, the other yeah. thing I will share, <laughs> this one's not as sentimental for sure. Uh, I still carry it with me today. It is definitely unique. Uh, and I don't think I've ever told anybody this, but I did mention that I had a problem with air sickness at pilot training. Uh, so I always carried an air sickness bag with me on, on every mission. Well, I got over that air sickness in, uh, in, in my pilot training days, the same air sickness bag. So the, the last one that I never used, right, was folded up into my kneeboard. It is still in my kneeboard today. Uh, <laughs> you know, I guess if, it, for fear of ever having uh, to use it again, but all, I think more for me, it's that reminder and the proof that like I, I got through that tough time. And so it's folded up in a little square. The only time I've taken it out is to show my students because I have, uh, I, I got the opportunity to be an instructor at the Air Force Academy. And my students a lot of times had problems with air sickness, you know, first times in airplanes. And I would always show them the, the, the beat up little air sickness bag that I had folded up to show them that, hey, you, you know, you can do it too. Like you're going to have these bumps in the roads. You're going to have things that don't go your way, uh, but you can, so you can do it too. So an American like flag that. and, an, and yeah. an air sickness bag. Why not? Right. Did, did you have to sneak the air sickness bag on? Is it looked down upon if you're an A-10 pilot with a thousand hours and you still got to have a bag with you? Like, do you have to kind of sneak it into the cockpit? Well, it's, it's, a little it's in the knee board, right? So nobody it's in, can it's see it's in my right? knee board. Yeah. So no one ever knew it was there, um, until I decided to show my students because I right. thought it would help. Right. Them. Um, <laughs> it wasn't really there for a uh, need, uh, anymore. You know, I got yeah. well past the air sickness. Um, but, uh, it was more of like, uh, just a reminder of those tough moments and those tough right. times that I made it through. And then on the flag, where is that today? Uh, the flag is actually still in my saddlebag. I have, so a saddlebag is uh, what we carry with all our pubs in the A-10. Um, and it's, it sits on the kind of the, in front of the cockpit with all our maps and publications. And it's still in there. It's interesting. I haven't unpacked that bag. It has my, my wow. pubs and my maps and my kneeboard from my last flight in the A-10. Um, That's really cool. That'll be yeah. an interesting moment when you unpack that thing. 
Yeah, I'm, it's, at some point it needs to go somewhere. Maybe it's my maybe it's my hope that someday I will just I will magically get the opportunity to fly the A10 again. <laughs> hey, C, we need you. We need we you to need come you. back. <laughs> and I would say <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> so that's my last question. If uh, if you could go back and all the times like nearly dying, obviously and getting hit like that, and the weather and the leadership challenges, um, and pushing yourself harder than you you may have advised others. Would you go back and do it all again? Yes, absolutely. In a heartbeat. You know, it wasn't easy. Um, I wouldn't want to do it again. Let's make this clear. I would, I, I don't, I wouldn't change anything, but I don't want to go through those things again. Once was enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, all those things made me the person that I am today. I think I'm a better fighter, pilot, leader, mom, wife, you name it because of all those hard experiences. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't change anything. I don't want to do it again, awesome. except maybe fly the A-10 again. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I am so appreciative of your time. This was so much fun for me personally. I'm really grateful that uh, you spent this long with us and, and dug into a lot of these stories. This is so fun to hear from a pilot's perspective, but I think, I, I, I believe people on the ground who have seen an A-10 in action and have saved their ass just yeah. love hearing about what it was like for you being up there. So thank you for this. Yeah, it's been fun thinking about and reminiscing about some of those old times. And we'll have ways for people to get a hold of you in the show notes uh, to reach you both for the speaking and just to follow what you're doing from a leadership perspective. So thanks a lot, Kim. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. I appreciate it. Our first comment comes from T. Norby on YouTube, and it's about the Jeff Morris interview. And he says, I commanded a company in 2ID in Ramadi. I lost too many guys. Some veteran stories I have a hard time believing. I believe this guy. I, I agree with you. I think for those who have served, you can tell when somebody's blowing smoke and we know Jeff isn't. Like he, he was telling some, some serious stories about the mistakes he made, people he lost, and how, how much it hurt, and you could just tell it was true. So uh, thanks for leaving that, uh, T. Norby. Um, very cool to hear that you were in Ramadi commanding a company. That's a huge deal, obviously. So thanks for your service, and thanks for taking the time to leave that. Our second comment comes from Mike S., also on YouTube. This one is about the Travis Hall interview. It says, Travis was an instructor I had at a course. Super awesome and crazy competent with mad skills. Definitely a class favorite as he is truly world class. Yeah, I guess um, when you're a long time Green Beret, you know how to train other people, but you can just tell he's so laid back and mellow and, and just so chill. I'm sure he was great to have as an instructor somewhere. I'd love to watch him uh, train in some of the, uh, the local forces back in the day, but I'm sure he still gets his training in with the uh, second chance canine. So thanks for leaving that comment, Mike. Really appreciate it. Stay safe, everyone.